Okay, so we just did Wednesday, November 3rd, and it didn't record on YouTube Live. So now we're going to start recording these um, on our own and then uploading them to YouTube. There's no reason to do live right now. Um, we'll do a live show in the future when we have redundancy measures in place. It's interesting. I went on a pretty good tangent, but it was probably longer. The good thing about being a creative is that you understand the importance of drafts and iteration. So we're going to quickly recap in a couple minutes what we said in the last video over probably like 20 minutes. Um, of course, I said, my name is Shaz with uh, California's 20th Congressional District running for Congress, the redistricting. So by uh, December 27th, I'll know what district I'm actually running for. It's not, not, not going to probably be the 20th district. But Shaz 420 would have been a good brand. Um, look at my videos. This will be the 8th, redoing the 8th. So I'll be saying the New York Times all over again. Just did it this morning, but it's okay. We'll go a little bit faster this time. We'll do a speed run. Wednesday, November 3rd. Um, what I do is I read the New York Times every day. Well, Monday through Friday to tease out the narratives so we can start auditing the stories we tell ourselves. I believe that's the breakdown in civilization right now is um, our narratives are unhinged from reality. We know that because much or most of our behavior is maladaptive, meaning it hurts ourself. Um, I just read somewhere about how many more times uh, an American male is likely to die compared to other developed nations. And then um, also look at how we split up the world as far as nations with one, some preying on others. Um, I almost went to Iraq, joined the army at 18, year 2000. So uh, when we look at the world and look at the narratives, what are the ones that pro promote war? As opposed, as opposed to Shaz over here in his peace sweater, promoting, well, you know, symbols. Symbols of peace, love, unity, prosperity. I created one myself. And that is a, a flash politic symbol. Um, the sign is a grounding sign for electricity, meaning we're trying to ground our energy. The ways to support me is we'll go backwards this time. You can reserve my books uh, on my uh, publishing company, Ten Bone Press, T E N B O N E P R E S S dot com. Um, once I get enough reservations, I'll send invoices and I'll put a, an order in to the printer. A really good guy over here. Uh, American printer, give people some money, spread it around among the people who share our values. If uh, you already know everything and you don't want, look, oh wait, let me describe the books. Good Barracks and Tao De Shaz. Tao De Shaz is T-A-O-T-E-S-H-A-Z-Z, -Z, that's me. Uh, Good Barracks is G-O-O-D-B-A-R-I-C-S. Link should be below as well. Well, no, I think we're going to switch it up. No, no, yeah. For this week, links will be below too. Um, yeah, so if you want to support me, you can reserve those books. And um, if you want to just kick me a couple bucks on Venmo, at Shazbar, S-H-A-Z-Z-B-A-R. Um, if you give me enough money, I'll give you a sticker. If you don't give me enough money, you ain't getting a sticker, as simple as that. But I mean, like, they cost me 30 cents. If you give me 35 cents, and I'm not doing anything, I might give you a sticker. Uh, oh no, you have to send me at least like a dollar because I got to mail it to. I don't know what stamps are these days. Now you can also spread the word, that is free. You're talking to someone and they're like, hey, what did you do yesterday? And you say, I watched this guy ramble online. I think he was stoned. And he said something about running for president, running for Congress, something. And then he started reading the newspaper. Did he, did he offer analysis of the news? No, he was just reading it. Was it his own reporting? No, it was the New York Times. So he read you the New York Times? No, like a shitty summary that sometimes doesn't even make sense because the sentences are all out of order. But we have fun, right? We have fun. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Okay, let me recap real quick what we said in the video that was erased. So we are promoting peace. Boom. These are the ways that you can help me out. The reason why we're promoting peace is because we've tried war <laughs> since World War II or even long before. Um, some people say war is always the nature of society. No, we're actually, we've been growing towards a more peaceful uh, world. 
That's how I read history. I have examples in my documents. If I err, tell me about where. Show me how you read history. But usually if you look at nature, aggression is very limited because it costs too, dim, too much damn energy. Most of the time we want to be peaceful. We are peaceful. We're going to promote peace. That is my instinct. So I don't even really plan what I'm doing. I just think, sit with myself, my emotions, listen to my heart as I advise others to do. And we live ex instinctually. We try not to hurt each other, though. You slow down when you think someone might be getting hurt. That's what I'm asking the world to do. I'm saying that you're hurting people. Let's slow down because people might be getting hurt. Let's slow down these wars now, please. It's enough. If people don't want to slow down, we're going to have to hold them accountable. That includes up to the penalty of death. Those are the laws you sign up for when you join the military, and it's military people who need to be held accountable, along with politicians and other people. We're going to start that discussion. We might not complete it, but we're going to start it. It's a discussion to be had as being documented on my Instagram, among other links and outlets. If you give me some money, we can speed up the discussion. If you don't give me money, we might not be able to continue the discussion. But we will see. I will always try my best. And we'll go from there. This is Reading the Times for Wednesday, November 3rd, 2011. Reading the Times for Wednesday, November 3rd, 2011. Eric Adams is elected mayor of New York City. I already knew that. Eric Leroy Adams, a former New York City police captain whose attention-grabbing persona and keen focus on racial justice fueled a decades-long career in public life, was elected on Tuesday as the 110th mayor of New York and the second black mayor in the city's history. Mr. Adams, who will take office on January 1st, faces a staggering set of challenges as the nation's largest city grapples with the enduring consequences of the pandemic, including a precarious and unequal economic recovery and continuing concerns about crime and the quality of city life, all shaped by stark political divisions over how New York should move forward. In New York City, even as Republicans appeared poised for the possibility of slight gains in the city council, Democrats won the marquee contest easily. In New York City, the difficulties that Mr. Adams, 61, will encounter were apparent even as he celebrated his victory. There will be contracts to negotiate with city workers and Eventually, the federal aid that helped pay for some city priorities will dwindle. He's restored confidence that the city is a place where business can thrive, said Catherine S. Wild, who leads a business-aligned partnership for New York City. A new direction in NYC, Eric Adams, will be the second black mayor in the city's history. With methane and forest deals, Climate Summit offers hope after gloomy start. Capping off two days of speeches and meetings, President Biden on Tuesday said that the United States pledged to be a partner with vulnerable countries confronting climate change, while expressing confidence that his own domestic climate agenda is on track to pass Congress despite the wobbling of a key Senate Democrat this week. Mr. Biden told reporters the meeting had reestablished the United States as a leader on what he has called an existential threat to humanity, saying America would keep raising its climate ambitions and that his engagement on the issue had drawn thanks from other heads of state. At an event unveiling the methane pledge, Mr. Biden and Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission and a partner in hosting the event, framed the agreement as one of the most effective ways countries around the world could quickly begin fighting the effects of climate change. John Kerry, Mr. Biden's special envoy on climate change, said he expected new financial commitments to fulfill a long-delayed promise to provide $100 billion a year in aid for developing countries to fight and adapt to global warming. Literally, his tundra is burning. He, is, he has serious climate problems, and he has been mum on his willingness to do anything. 
The criticisms of China from U.S. officials, including Mr. Biden's national security advisors, comment that the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter has an obligation to step up, drew a lengthy rebuke from China's foreign ministry and some Chinese media outlets on Tuesday. Mr. Biden said in his news conference that he expected to lead his $1.8 trillion climate change and social safety net bill through Congress and into law. Prominent conservatives back letting status limit guns. <laughs> Prominent conservatives back letting states limit guns in public places. <clears throat> we have to speed this up. This is going to be a while. One of the longest continuous traditions in Anglo-American law are limits on the public carry of arms in public. The New York law requires that people seeking a license to carry handguns outside their homes show a proper cause to men who are denied the licenses they sought sued along with the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, saying that the state makes it Im virtually impossible for the ordinary law-abiding citizen to obtain a license. California, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Rhode Island all have similar laws, according to briefs filed in the case. Strict gun laws in Washington, D.C., the brief said, doubtless saved many lives during its January 6, 2021 insurrection. Mr. Ludig, who advised Vice President Mike Pence during this fraught time, said many of the protesters did not bring their guns because they did not want to be in violation of the law. It would have been much worse, Mr. Ludig said. Mr. Clement wrote that his clients quarrel with the New York licensing system and they did not challenge... His, his clients quarrel was with the New York licensing system and they did not challenge any of New York's many separate licensing laws prohibiting handguns in specific sensitive places. When the Supreme Court revolutionized Second Amendment law in 2008 in District of Columbia versus Heller, establishing an individual's right to keep guns in their home for self-defense, the majority looked to history to determine the original meaning of the amendment. The court is poised to use a challenge to a Mississippi law that bars most abortions after 15 weeks to undermine and perhaps overturn Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision to establish a cons constitutional right to abort. In 2011, dissent, written when he was still an appeals court judge, Justice Kavanaugh said that the Supreme Court precedent, oh my gosh, messing this up. Kavanaugh said that the Supreme Court's precedent leaves little doubt that the courts are to assess gun bans and regulations based on text, history, and tradition, not by a balancing test. Though he acknowledged that analyzing the history and tradition of gun laws in the United States does not always yield an easy answer. Justice Amy Coney Barrett, in 2019 dissent, when she served on a federal appeals court, also looked to history to conclude the law, to conclude that a law forbidding people with felony convictions from owning guns should not apply when the crimes in question were nonviolent. And she wrote that when she was uh, on a federal appeals court. And she was a dissenting opinion, which means that they, they disagreed with her. All right. Very good. Minneapolis, voter reject, Minneapolis voters reject an amendment to replace the police department. Minneapolis residents rejected an amendment on Tuesday that called on replacing the city's long-troubled police department with a new Department of Public Safety. The ballot item emerged from anger after a Minneapolis police officer murdered George Floyd last year, galvanizing residents who saw the policing system as irredeemably broken. The amendment's failure showed that even in a liberal city where skepticism of the police runs deep, many Americans are not prepared to get rid of the police. Minneapolis leaders now face the challenge of filing sh staffing shortages in a police department that is about a third smaller than the time it than it was before Mr. Floyd's killing, and at a time when the city is facing the most homicides since the mid-1990s. Even though voters were bitterly divided over the charter amendment, the city has been largely united in a view that meaningful reforms to policing are needed. Under the amendment, the city council would have more oversight over the agency that replaced the police department, which would be focused on public health and, according to the ballot language, 
could include licensed peace officers if necessary. Supporters of the measure, who largely steered away from describing the plan as one to defund the police, framed it as a way to help the city move past the pain of the past 18 months and create a more equitable system. Facebook, citing societal concerns, plans to shut down facial recognition system. Jerome Pesente, vice president of artificial intelligence at Meta, Facebook's newly named parent company, said in a blog post on Tuesday that the social network was making the change because of many concerns about the place of facial recognition technology in society. He added that the company still saw the software as a powerful tool, but every new technology brings with it potential for both benefit and concern, and we want to find the right balance. The decision shutters a feature that was introduced in December 2010 so that Facebook users could save time. Over the last decade, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, a Washington-based privacy advocacy group, filed two complaints about Facebook's use of facial recognition with the FTC. When the FTC fined Facebook in 2019, it named the site's confusing privacy settings around facial recognition as one of the reasons for the penalty. The leak of internal documents by a former Facebook employee has provided an intimate look at the operations of the secretive social media company and renewed calls for better regulation of the company's wide reach into the lives of its users. In September, the Wall Street Journal published The Facebook Files, a series of reports based on leaks, leaked documents. During an interview with 60 Minutes that aired on October 3rd, Frances Hagen, a Facebook product manager who left the company in May, revealed that she was responsible for the leak of those internal documents. Documents from the Facebook papers show the degree to which Facebook knew of extremist groups on its site trying to polarize American voters before the election. Justice Department sues Penguin Random House over Simon & Schuster deal. The lawsuit focuses much of its attention on the market for the rights to books publishers believe will be top sellers and documents several bidding wars between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster that went into the high six and seven figures. In response to the Justice Department's decision, Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster issued a joint statement noting that Penguin Random House has not planned any reduction in the number of books acquired or in the amounts paid to those for those acquisitions. The rationale for bringing the companies together, they said, was to find efficiencies that would save money on the back end, and that it had no plans for, to reduce the number of books it acquires or the amount it pays for them. Many of the most sought-after books sell at auction, with multiple publishing houses bidding against one another. The rules at Penguin Random House have allowed for some internal competition, but only if they if there was also an outside party involved, says Knopf and Riverhead, both owners, both owned by Penguin Random House. <laughs> Wait, say, so Knopf and Riverhead, both owned by Penguin Random House, could compete as long as there was another publisher house, publishing house in the game. In September, Marcus Dole, Penguin Random House's chief executive, held a virtual meeting with literary agents in an effort to address the concerns. With books by Barack and Michelle Obama, some of the most enormous blockbusters of recent years, visible behind him. The book business has been transformed by mergers and acquisitions in the past decade, a shift that accelerated with the merger of Penguin and Random House in 2013. Shutting down historical debate, China makes it a crime to mock heroes. China's Communist Party has long policed dissent, severely restricting public discourse of topics that seem to be it deemed to be politically incorrect, from Tibet to Tiananmen Square protests. The camp campaign reflects an ambition by Mr. Xi to solidify a moral foundation for the Communist Party's supremacy, a theme that Chinese leaders often invoke in speeches and articles. The party once could rely on the financial inducements of a booming economy and coercive control of the security state to cement its rule, but now appears to be using political and historical orthodoxy as a foundation, said Adam Ni, director of China policy, China of uh, director of the China Policy Center in Australia, and editor of China Story. Mr. Xi, preparing for what is likely to be a third term as a Communist Party leader beginning next year, will use a gathering of the party elite in Beijing next week to adopt a new resolution on the party's history, unofficial summation of the past and its lessons, 
Last month, a former journalist, Luo Zhengpin, was detained in Huainan after he wrote a blog questioning the rationale for China's intervention into the Korean War and the catast catastrophic cost for those volunteers sent to fight and die in it. John Delury, a professor of Chinese studies at Yonsei University in Seoul and the author of a forthcoming book about the war, said that even within the limits of political censorship, Chinese scholars have done a lot of great work on the war and other historical events since the founding of the People's Republic of China. Torn from parents in the Belgian Congo, woman seeks reparations. Like thousands of other mixed-race children born under colonial rule in Belgian Congo, the five girls, the children of African mothers and European fathers, were taken from their homes by the authorities and sent to religious schools hundreds of miles away, growing up in poverty and suffering from malnutrition and physical abuse. Belgian civil servants snatched some children from their families or coerced the parents of others into handing over their children to Catholic institutions, cooperating with the state. In 2019, the Belgian government apologized for the systemic, systematic kidnapping, segregation, deportation, and forced adoption of biracial children during its colonial rule. In Canada, a national commission concluded that a government's residential school program that separated at least 150,000 indigenous children from their families from 1883 to 1996 amounted to cultural genocide. The discoveries earlier this year of hundreds of unmarked graves of children who died in the school had prompted a new reckoning over the government's historical policies. What is clear is that the mixed-race children were seen as a threat, according to Delphine Lowers, the lead archivist of Résolution Métis, a state-run research project created after the Belgian parliament apologized in 2018. So the Belgian state decided to confine the mixed-race children in, in between a liminal space where they were excluded from both categories. The five, that was a good friend, yeah, to admit, that was okay accent. They're getting better. The five plaintiffs grew up together in Catholic school in Katan, Katende, in what, is, in what is the province of Kasai in the Democratic Republic of Congo today. U.S.-Russia engagement deepens as CIA head travels as CIA head travels to Moscow. William J. Burns, the CIA director, met with a top advisor to President Vladimir V. Putin in Moscow on Tuesday, leading a delegation of American officials on a two-day visit to the Russian capital. That served as the latest evidence of heightened engagement between the two global adversaries. The surprise visit was something of a merger of Mr. Burns' current role as intelligence chief and his past jobs as a senior American diplomat and State Department official. American officials have also said that Moscow has been helpful in ongoing talks with Iran about its nuclear program. After landing on Tuesday, Mr. Burns sat down with Mr. Petrushev, who is a secretary of the Kremlin Security Council and widely seen as the most powerful figure among the intelligence officials in Mr. Putin's inner circle. Russian officials have publicly floated the possibility of a second meeting between Mr. Putin and Mr. Biden before the end of the year, although the White House has not confirmed another summit is under consideration. American officials would likely want to see some further progress on the issues discussed in Geneva before agreeing on another meeting. Ooh, intrigue, spy versus spy. Dozens killed in ISIS attack on military hospital in Afghanistan capital. The attack, which included armed gunmen and at least one suicide bomber, targeted the 400-bed Sardar Muhammad Daud Khan military hospital in one of Kabul's most affluent neighborhoods, where both wounded soldiers who had fought for the former government and Taliban fighters were both being treated. Zabihullah, Mahid, Mah Zabihullah Mujahid a spokesman for the Taliban, said the attack was carried, by, carried out by several members of the Islamic State, including a suicide bomber who detonated his explosives at the gate of the hospital. A car full of explosives outside the hospital also exploded, 
wounding dozens and several Taliban fighters were killed and wounded in the ensuing gun battle. Mr. Muja Hid said, one doctor at the hospital who declined to be named out of fear for his safety said that the gunman had entered a ward filled with wounded Taliban fighters and shot them in their beds. Kwari Said Kosti, a spokes spokesman for the Ministry of the Interior, confirmed on Twitter there had been at least one explosion at the hospital and Taliban forces were responding to the attacks. The Sardar Mohammed Daud Khan Military Hospital had been attacked repeatedly in past years by both the Islamic State and the Taliban. Once a climate leader, Brazil falls short in Glasgow. Brazil, a global climate leader turned environmental offender under President Jair Bolsonaro, approached the United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow, ready to prove it was changing course, with commitments to create a green jobs program, cut carbon emissions, and curb deforestation. On Monday, Brazil committed to cut Emission, to cutting emissions in half by 2030, achieving carbon, carbon neutrality by 2050, and ending illegal deforestation by 2028, a step up from its pledge last year. In a video shared by one of the summit's side events, Mr. Bolsonaro called Brazil a green power and declared that in the fight against climate change, we have always been a part of the solution, not the problem. On Tuesday, Brazil joined more than 100 other countries in pledging to reduce methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Still, Mr. Bols Mr. Bolsonaro's absence goes against the argument that Brazil reversing course. <laughs> Still, Mr. Bolsonaro's absence goes against the argument that Brazil is re reversing course, said Natalie Unt Unterstel, the president of the Institute Tolanoa. Talano I'm ruining these names said Natalie Unterstel, the president of the Institute Telenoa, a climate policy think tank. In 2015, as a part of the Paris Agreement, Brazil has promised to slash carbon emissions by 43%. Once again, Brazil fails to show ambition. Then there is a matter of Brazil's record. Biden tries to reassert American leadership and his own. President Biden's major goal for his second foreign trip since taking office was to reassert America's ability to lead the world on climate change before it's too late. Before, from the moment he landed in Rome on Friday for the Group of 20 meeting and then traveled to the climate summit in Glasgow, Mr. Biden took on the role of a traveling salesman, exulting in the backslapping, personalized politics he believes makes him a strong negotiator and can translate to substantive deal-making. Confronted with the lack of consensus among world leaders on how to move forward globally and with his climate agenda hanging in the balance at, in Congress at home, Mr. Biden's time in Glasgow laid bare the reality that the personal style he prefers has not yet helped him close the gulf between his ambition and what he has been able to achieve. Representative Ro Khanna, a California Democrat who had been working with the president to refashion his climate agenda, said in an interview that Mr. Biden told him ahead of his trip to Europe that America's prestige was on the line. So Mr. Biden Ro, let me see, said in an interview that Mr. Biden told him. So this is a guy, a California Democrat, saying that Mr. Biden told me that our prestige is on the line. Mr. Biden is eager to establish himself as a global leader of collective action on climate policy. If my, Mr. Biden can secure passage, the bill, which includes $555 billion to fight climate change, largely through tax incentives for low emission sources of energy, would be the most ambitious plan adopted by the United States yet. Global leaders pledge to end deforestation by 2030. Leaders of more than 100 countries, including Brazil, China, Russia, and the United States, vowed at climate talks in Glasgow to end deforestation by 2030 in a landmark agreement that encompasses some 85% of the world's forests. Meanwhile, the Amazon is already on the brink and can't survive years more deforestation. Forest, forest loss in 2020. There were bright spots, but the total lost acreage increased by 12%. Overall, from the year before, according to new research, nevertheless, the pledge underscores a growing awareness of the role of nature in tackling the climate crisis, something Britain has sought to highlight 
at the Climate Summit, known as COP26, one program recognized in the Paris Climate Accord, the agreement among nations to work together in an effort to fight climate change, seeks to pay forced nations for reducing tree loss. In 2014, an international pact known as the New York Declaration on Force aimed to end deforestation by 2030, and a United Nations plan announced three years later built on that pledge. Yet deforestation continued. Supporters of the new agreement point out that it expands the number of countries and comes with specific steps to save the forest. China suffered heavy forest loss as its population and industry grew over the past decades, though more recently has pledged to regrow forests and to expand sustainable tree farming. Ethiopia declares state of emergency as rebels advance towards capital. The Tigrayans, who have been fighting the government for the past year, have joined forces with another rebel group as they advance on the capital. Addis Ababa, in recent days, Mr. Abi has blamed the loss on unidentified foreigners, he says, are fighting along the Tigrayans. The Tigrayans, for their part, say they are fighting to break a siege that has strangled their region and starved their people. We need more than drips. Human rights groups have also secured Tigrayan fighters have also accused Tigrayan fighters of abuses, including the killing of Eritrean fighters, although not on the same scale as Ethiopian troops. The Ethiopian government accused Tigrayan fighters of killing youth residents in Kombolcha in recent days, but provided no evidence. In recent weeks, for reasons that are unclear, the Eritreans have been nowhere to be seen in the latest fighting, Tigrayan and Western officials said. Building in, Nigeria, building in Nigeria has abnormalities before collapse. Construction on a high-rise building that collapsed on Monday in Lagos killed at least 20 people. Oh, killing at least 20 people. Has, and I'm sorry for you people. Sometimes you read these news and you're like, these people die, these people die, and you're just like, oh, these people die. Like, 20 people died. And we're like, so I just, every now and then I'm like, I'm sorry we're talking about it, but we're including their story in our greater story. It's just like, oh, 20 people. I just had a moment of empathy. I don't know. Construction on a high-rise building that collapsed Monday in Lagos, killing at least 20 people, had been ordered halted earlier this year after inspectors found abnormalities, the authority said on Tuesday. The 21-story structure was cordoned off in June after it had failed to meet sp structural spe specifications, said the Lagos State Deputy Governor Obafa Obafemi Hamza. The Lagos state government said on Tuesday it was setting up an independent panel composed of professional engineering and architecture groups to look into the latest collapse. As a first step, the Lagos governor, Babajide Sanwa Olo, announced, that's probably not how you say that, announced that he had indefinitely suspended Mr. Oki, the building control agency head. Officials voiced assurances that the inquiry would be a thorough we wish to state that there would be no cover-up in the search for truth in this incident. Gabenge Omotosis, a Lagos State Commissioner for Information and Strategy, said in a statement, nine people, all men, had been rescued, according to Lagos state officials. Let's listen to Lagos people talk, or how they talk in English. We're not gonna, we won't understand them if they talk in their native. Lagos country. Let's put in Lagos, and we'll put in... Uh, Poetry. So that way we get their accent but saying something beautiful. Oh, I have to do a video. Yeah, I think this works. See, I could take more risks now that I'm not live. Because I'm not going to edit this unless it's horrible, horrible. What the heck? I didn't get the poem. Here we go. We will try this. A cinematic poem. I should show what this is. Give credit. I raise my hand and flag him down. I 
most of the time. I have to jump into the moving tricycle. The city. I plan to start my pride just to get to my destination on time. It'd be crazy to think your pride will get you anyway. Not here. Not this land. This land tries on its ability to humble you. In the twinkle of an eye, it chooses the king to a beggar. It throws you off your horse and brings you down to your knees. It's toxic. What's my life? Oh, my child. I ain't like they happen, but I can call my guy up like, guy, I did go hook with us. Just block me for 1,000 and for me to link up. You know how to be now. Any money rush to get a special work on you from me as a girl. Before I make my way down to the office. Ahead of every bodied man arguing about politics at the vendor stand. The four lanes on the two lane road. <laughs> it's madness. The noise of cars on Guinea's music to my ears. It makes me smile. This is what I live for. On why stage? I never already cashed. Same characters. Same characters. Different rules. It's a movie of its own. Some may call it shit O. A shit O. Their business. For me, it's an adventure. Lagos not bad at all, Joe. Then I step out and I kill. It eats me. You see of human flowing past and the government and the brains I really don't want. I'm trying to get away. A place where I can breathe. I look to the sky. There's really a space for all of us to fly. Then why is the sky empty? And the heart. But I won't let it break me. Though the vastness of the sea if we try to drown me out. It is the survivor of the fittest. It may not be how I found my life, but I will live it to the fullest. Some days I will want to run away. Some days I'll be the first to say, it is not worth it. Some days I will even say I'm going to escape. But this is my land, in Kuile. My parents conquered, so will I. It's interesting. Here I am, I forgot Lagos was even in Nigeria. Let's go a little back. We're gonna do this in the reviews, but this is just practice review, I guess. This is really supposed to be the well, I mean, eventually I'm going to have my own podcast where I'll talk on stuff. But let's just practice, yeah. It's a city in Nigeria. So that's the building that collapsed. I always wondered that, why the New York Times doesn't give us backgrounds or... I mean, it's just information out of context, but... That gives us some context of Lagos. Lagos, Nigeria's largest city, sprawls inland from the Gulf of Guinea across Lagos Lagoon, Victoria Island, the financial center of the metropolis, is known as its... It's known for its beach resorts, boutiques, and nightlife. Lagos. So it's like, uh, well, Nigeria. And I'm pulling up a map right now. Oh, Nigeria is on the inside. I didn't realize that Nigeria was on the inside of Africa. Let's see if I could show you guys. Boom, boom. You see? Yeah, it puts a. I always wanted a map in the New York Times, so you can see just where all the stuff is. That was a heavy poem, though. That's interesting, heavy poem. Oh, so now we honor those people a little bit better. The twenty people who died, right? Learn a little bit of the culture. Listen to a poem. It sounds like a hard place to live. Sounds like if there is a scramble for Africa, and right now people are colonizing Africa, these neo empires which never really left. That's the face of your suffering right there. The pain you hear in that guy's voice as he reads his poem. I hope that got through. I'll only know when I end this, but it's interesting. Um, 
Yeah, so corruption, corruption in Africa is killing them as if they weren't already being killed from all the other stuff that the current world system puts on them. And art captured all of that emotion. That's what art does. Palestinian families reject deal in an area that helped set off Gaza conflict. A group of Palestinian families in East Jerusalem, whose looming eviction led to an 11-day war in Gaza, rejected a compromise on Tuesday that would have allowed them to stay in their homes for several decades if they agreed to pay a nominal rent to a Jewish settler group that courts have ruled are the building's real owners. The agreement, proposed by Israel's high court, did not recognize them as owners of their homes, they said, and it would obscure what they perceive as a wider Israeli strategy to displace Palestinians from East Jerusalem. Palestinians see the case as emblematic of an Israeli effort to cement control over the eastern half of the city, ultimately making it harder for East Jerusalem to become the capital of a future Palestinian state. In recent decades, settler groups have moved into several neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, prompting dozens of eviction battles. The foreign ministry has previously described the case as a real estate dispute between private parties that the Palestinian leadership has exploited to incite violence in Jerusalem. The dispute in Sheikh Jarrah has its roots in the 19th century, when the city was govern governed by the Ottoman Empire. After Israel captured East Jerusalem in 1967, the land was returned to the Jewish Trust, which then sold it to various settler groups. Intimate Portraits of Mexico's Third Generation Mushas There, alongside a community of fellow Mushas, people who are born male but who adopt roles and identities associated with women, she will vie to be crowned the queen of the ceremony. As Zapotecs, an indigenous people of Mexico, they are part of a community that has long accepted and celebrated the Mushas, who are broadly considered a third gender. Many Mushas assume roles with Zapotec society that are traditionally associated with women. They cook, embroider garments, work as hairdressers, complete household chores, care for children and elderly relatives. Estrella is among them. Alongside other interests, she designs the elaborate embroidery of traditional Zapotec dresses, full of flowers and other natural elements that flood every celebration or festivity on the isthmus with color. Danced, ate, and drank in celebration. Notably, Mushi children are traditionally forbidden from leaving their parents' home to start their own families or live independently with their partners. For Holocaust scholar, another confrontation with neo-Nazi hate. Dr. Lifstadt, a professor of modern Jewish history and Holocaust studies at Emory University, is scheduled to appear in Charlottesville on Wednesday for the plaintiffs in Sinas versus Kessler, a civil case brought against two dozen neo-Nazis and white nationalist groups who organized the 2017 Unite the Right rally in the college town. Dr. Lipstach declined to comment for this article. Attorneys for the plaintiffs barred her from, from interviews before her testimony. But in a 48-page report she prepared for the trial, she wrote that this fear of active replacement by the Jew, derived directly from the historical underpinnings of anti-Semitism, is a central feature of contemporary anti-Semitism. Two animuses, racism and anti-Semitism, come together, oh no, this is her still, two animuses, racism and anti-Semitism, come together in the concept of a white genocide or white replacement theory. Dr. Lisbstadt wrote in the article, in the report, the animating ideology, greater replacement theory, the anim their animating ideology, great replacement theory, the false idea that religious and racial minorities are being bent on eradicating white Christians or replacing them in society, has moved from the fringes to the mainstream, Dr. Lipstadt and civil rights groups said. Dr. Lipstadt cites multiple examples of the Unite the Right organizers extending great replacement theory, extending great replacement theory to members of other races, including an online appeal by the white nationalist Richard Spencer, a defendant in the Charlottesville case, who is representing himself. Well, you just roll over and let them roughshod over white culture and white people. Will you join us? Dr. Lipstedt received her undergraduate degree from the City College of New York and her master's. 
degree and PhD from Brandeis University. In 1993, Dr. Lipstadt published Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory. The English writer David Irving, who Dr. Lipstadt described in the book as the most dangerous Holocaust denier, responded by suing her and her publisher, Penguin Books, for libel in Britain, whose system differs from the American in that it reverses the burden of proof, putting the onus on Dr. Lipstadt to prove the statement at issue was true. Clashing portrayals of Kyle Rittenhouse in testimony on Kenosha shootings. On the first day of testimony in the homicide trial, for Kyle Rittenhouse, prosecutors and defense lawyers offered sharply divergent portrayals of Mr. Rittenhouse, an 18-year-old from Illinois who faced, faces the prospect of life in prison. Prosecutors began their case by describing Mr. Rittenhouse as a dangerous type of tourist, a teenager who came to Kenosha, Wisconsin, bearing a military-style semiotic rifle that he possessed illegally, bought for him by a friend because he was only 17 at the time. Mr. Rittenhouse shot three men, killing two during protest against police violence in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He faces six counts, including first-degree intentional homicide. Out of the hundreds of people that came to Kenosha during that week, the hundreds of people that were out on the street that week, the evidence will show that the only person who killed anyone was the defendant, Kyle Rittenhouse. Among the three witnesses whom prosecutors called to testify on Tuesday were Mr. Black, the friend who bought the gun for Mr. Rittenhouse during a trip to Ladysmith, Wisconsin, several months before the Kenosha shootings. On the day of the shooting, Mr. Black testified he and Mr. Rittenhouse went together to downtown Kenosha, with Mr. Black toting his own nearly identical gun, where they eventually joined other men, guarding a used car lot. Risk your life in jail for a used car lot. Supreme Court hears free speech case on politicians' censure. The basic question at a Supreme Court argument on Tuesday was whether elected bodies can violate the First Amendment when they censure their members for something they said. Put another way, are censures, which are formal reprimands and a kind of punishment, a form of free speech or a threat to it? The answer to that question, several justices said, did not seem difficult. Unless there's something special about the word censure, and maybe there is, this is a, a very easy case, said Justice Samuel A. Alito, Jr. One person says something derogatory about another person, and then the other person responds by saying something derogatory about the first person. Nobody's free speech rights are violated there. The case was brought by David Wilson, a former elected trustee of the Houston Community College System and an energetic critic of its work. Justice Barrett added, if the same member walks out on the steps and gives a press conference and repeats the exact same racial slurs, that's not subject to censure ever. And that's correct, Mr. Kimberly said. Justice Clarence Thomas appeared wary of having courts become involved in the rough and tumble of politics. Justice Stevens G. Breyer echoed that point, saying that if we get in the business of starting to really oversee this, we're really changing, then we've changed the government structure significantly. Justice Brett M. Kavanaugh said that the court should consider a narrow ruling. I, I thought the issue, the, all we had to decide, was a mere censure does not trigger a retaliatory, retaliatory retaliation claim. So Pan Joshi, a lawyer for the federal government, arguing in support of the system's board, said that there are ample historical examples to establish that a censure resolution adopted by an elected body against one of its members does not abridge that member's freedom of speech. Richard A. Morris, a lawyer for the system board in the case, Houston Community College System versus Wilson, number 2804, said the power to censure was essential to the current political climate. Prominent conservatives back letting states limit guns in public. Oh, we already read this one. I did read that twice. Okay. I remember I did that last time too. So I would have read that four times if I had read that again. Eh. Lawyer for Rust, assistant director, says checking gun was not his job. 
A lawyer for the assistant director of the film Rust, whose law enforcement officials said had handed the gun to the actor Alec Baldwin before it discharged a live round, killing the cinematographer, said in an interview on Fox News Monday that it's not his responsibility to check the weapon. The assistant director, David Halls, has told the detectives shortly after the fatal shooting that when the movie's armorer had shown him the firearm to inspect its rounds, he should have checked all of them, but he didn't, according to an affidavit released by the sheriff's office in Santa Fe County, New Mexico. According to another affidavit, Mr. Hall had called out cold gun, cold gun, indicating that the gun did not contain any live rounds, and handed it to Mr. Baldwin. Mr. Hall's lawyer, Lisa Toraco, contended in an interview with Martha McCollum on Fox News that the main responsibility for checking the gun was with the, far, far, with the film's armor, claiming that it was not the assistant director's job. What I can tell you is that expecting an assistant director to check a firearm is like telling the assistant director to check the camera angle or telling the assistant director to check the sound or lighting, she said in an interview. That's not the assistant director's job. If he chooses to check the firearm because he wants to make sure that everyone's safe, he can do that, but that's not his responsibility. You can get a sense of what type of person this is, right? The, the film director, Joel Souza, who was wounded in the shooting, later told the te defective detectives that the firearm was checked by the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, and then the firearm is checked by the assistant director, David Halls, who then gives it to the actor using the firearm, according to another affidavit released as part of a search warrant application. Larry Zanoff, a veteran armorer who in the pa whose past films include Django Unchained and Fantastic Four, said that it was common practice on a film set for the first assistant director to be one of the people responsible for inspecting guns on set, including checking to make sure a gun is empty before the armorer hands it to an actor. In an affidavit released by the sheriff's department, a detective, Joel Cano, wrote that he learned that shortly before the shooting, Mr. Hall had picked up the gun from a gray cart that had been set up by Miss Gutierrez-Reed and had taken it onto set, where he handed it to Mr. Baldwin and yelled, Cold gun. Miss Toraco disputed the chain of events in the Fox interview, saying, The idea that my client grabbed a gun off a prop cart and handed it to Mr. Baldwin absolutely did not happen. Miss Toraco said she heard different accounts from crew, makers, crew members on set. Alvin Bragg wins, becomes first black Manhattan DA. Mr. Bragg said he would show leniency to defendants who commit low-level crimes and has emphasized the importance of accountability for the police and the office's prosecutors. Mr. Bragg will be working in close partnership with a police department run by Eric Adams, who won the race for mayor on Tuesday night. In an interview earlier on Tuesday, Mr. Bragg pointed towards experiences that would inform his work and set him apart from his predecessors. Mr. Bragg's policy positions are largely in line with others who have won office over the past decade, including Raphael Rollins in Boston and Kim Fox in Chicago. Mr. Bragg won handily, and the Associated Press called the race for him just before 9.30 p.m. on Tuesday. A lifelong resident of Harlem, Mr. Bragg began running for district attorney more than two years ago and slowly accumulated support from local political clubs and unions and from figures including representatives Gerald L. Nadler and Preet Bharara, a former U.S. attorney from the South, for the South District who hired Mr. Bragg as a federal prosecutor in Manhattan. Glenn Youngkin, a Republican financier, defeats Terry McAuliffe in the Virginia governor's race. Republicans claim the governorship of Virginia for the first time in more than a decade on Wednesday, electing the businessman Glenn Youngkin and presenting their party with a formula for how to exploit President Biden's vulnerabilities and evade the shadow of Donald J. Trump in Democratic-leaning Democrat, states. Mr. Youngkin, 54, a wealthy former private equity executive making his first run in politics, elevated education and taxes while projecting a suburban dad demeanor to demonstrate he was different from Mr. Trump without saying so outright. We're going to continue that fight. Significantly, Mr. Trump appeared unusually content to be kept at arm's length by Mr. Youngkin, remaining mostly silent as a Republican candidate declined to invite him to the state. For Republicans, particularly those uneasy with Mr. Trump and battered by the party's string of losses on his watch, Mr. Youngkin's triumph delivered the moment of exultation. Clad in a fleece vest and sporting a smile on the campaign trail, Mr. Youngkin happily claimed support for the, from the so-called never-Trumpers and forever-Trumpers, while otherwise voicing a center-right agenda in a state where Republicans had not won statewide since 2009. 
in part because Mr. McAuliffe was so dedicated to a strategy of inserting Mr. Trump into the race, Mr. Youngkin evaded scrutiny about his own views on policy, while on issues like abortion and same-sex marriage were to the right of many Virginia voters. Democrats add drug cost curbs to social policy plan, pushing for a vote. House Democrats reached a deal on Tuesday to add a measure of to curb prescription drug costs to President Biden's $1.85 trillion social safety net plan, agreeing to allow the government for the first time to negotiate prices for medications covered by Medicare as they push for a quick vote on the bill. Most drugs would still be granted patent exclusivity for nine years before negotiations could start, and more complex drugs called biologics would be protected for 12 years. Fixing prescription drug pricing has consistently been a top issue for Americans year after year, including the vast majority of both Democrats and Republicans who want to see it change because they simply cannot afford the medications, said Senator Chuck Schumer, Democrat of New York and the majority leader. Today, we've taken a massive step forward in helping alleviate the problem. Speaker Nancy Pelosi of California declared that Democrats will deliver strong prescription drug negotiations to lower prices for our seniors and halt Big Pharma's outrageous price hikes above inflation. Stephen J. Ubel, the president and chief executive of the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, the industry's main trade group, criticized the deal. The prescription drug co companies compromise. The prescription drug compromise was hard fought and required the Democrats to overcome an onslaught of lobbying by the powerful pharmaceutical industry which succeeded in weakening the initial proposal to allow the government to negotiate prices on a broader universe of drugs. Her office then released a statement saying that she welcomed a new agreement on historic transformative Medicare drug negotiation plan that will reduce out-of-pocket costs by seniors, ensuring drug prices cannot rise faster than inflation, save taxpayer dollars, and protect innovation to ensure Arizonans and Americans continue to have access to life-saving medications and new cures and therapeutics. The agreement on state and local tax was still being hammered out on Tuesday, but Democrats said it would suspend the $10,000 cap on the so-called SALT deductions for five years. If the Supreme Court claims power over gun carry laws, it will be making a grave mistake. The Supreme Court will soon decide whether Americans have a constitutional right to carry loaded concealed weapons in public and in public places, wherever and whenever they believe they might need their guns for self-defense. At stake in New York, at stake in New York State, Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin is whether the Supreme Court will claim for itself the power to decide where and when Americans can carry loaded handguns in public, a power that the Constitution reserves for the people and their elected representatives. The court should affirm the constitutionality of New York's public carry statute and the other statutes nationwide that limit and restrict the public carry of handguns. For the justices to begin deciding for the people exactly where and when a person has a right to carry a handgun in public would be to establish a court as essentially a national review board for public carry regulations, precisely the kind of constitutional commandeering of the democratic process that the conservatives and conservative jurors have long lamented in other areas of the law, such as abortion. The District of Columbia bans handguns in public in many places, including at or near protests in broad area near the Capitol and White House, and on public transit. As a matter of public policy, some justices might favor an absolute or near-absolute right to carry a handgun in public. We should all know less about each other. I remember this article well. In 2017, after the shock of Brexit and then Donald Trump's election, Christopher Bale, a professor of sociology and public policy at Duke University, set out to study what would happen if you forced people out of their social media echo chambers. At the time, a lot of the concern about the Internet's role in the public polarization centered around whether the digital activist, about what the digital activist Eli Pariser once called filter bubbles, a term for the way that increasingly personalized Internet the unincreasingly personalized internet traps people in self-reinforcing information silos. Republicans in particular become much more conservative when they follow the Democrat bot, and the Democrats in self and the Democrats become a little bit more liberal. Uh, social media platforms have long justified themselves with the idea that connecting people would make the world more open and humane. People in conservative communities don't need to hear about it every time San Francisco considers renaming a public school. In 2017, 
Deb Roy, director of the MIT Center for Constructive Communication and former chief media scientist at Twitter, held informal meetings in small towns to talk to people about social media. Several times people told them they, they'd given up speaking to neighbors or others in town after seeing them express their opinions online. The road to climate recovery goes through the wild woods. Territorial rights of indigenous people must be recognized, protected, forest areas expanded, and roads and industry avoided in still intact forests. More ominous, the often overlooked northern boreal forests grow in soils that hold carbon equal to 190 times the global carbon emissions of last year and are being relentlessly diced and burned. In the tropics, intact forests store an average of twice the carbon held in forests bisected by roads or otherwise disturbed by development. Protecting tropical forests can secure 7 to 10 times as much carbon through 2050 as replanting forests. Protecting these forests is crucial to maintaining the homes and way of life for thousands of forest cultures, people who speak as many as a quarter of the Earth's language. Leaders determined to save the climate cooling forests can support these forest guardians by enacting and maintaining land policies that assure indigenous peoples' inability, inalienable right to the future territories. A quietly big idea on how we think about homeless people. Are they unhoused a people? If the answer is yes, then don't they deserve equal protection under the law? These questions were broached last week by the American Civil Liter Liberties Union of Southern California in a long report titled Outside the Law, the Legal War Against Unhoused People. Rather than think of homelessness as a condition, the authors argue the lawmakers should protect those who live on the street the same way the Constitution and California law protect groups based on race, gender, or religion. If, say, a city enacted a policy that made it illegal for homeless people to use public bathrooms, advocates for the homeless could then sue. California's homelessness crisis can sometimes feel like a never-ending series of catastrophes, but Eve Guerra, one of the report's authors, believes we have reached an inflection point when it comes to the treatment of unhoused people. Local governments have become increasingly sophisticated in finding ways to discriminate against and persecute unhoused people. Most Californians agree something has to be done. While there's a lot of inefficiency and often a sense of hopelessness on the side of helping the unhoused, law enforcement and hostile local governments have taken a decisive, coordinated action to clean out camps, jail individuals, and pass legislation that effectively makes being homeless illegal within city limits. Is there some danger or at least some irresponsibility in extending protections to people based on what some might call a temporary or even deserved condition? Will it lead to protections for any people who want to proclaim themselves a group? I don't actually have any fears about that, Garo said. As the Fed prepares to slow support, attention shifts to increased rates. Economists increasingly expect the Fed tomorrow to move its policy rate up from near zero, where it has been since March 2020, as soon as next summer. Investors as a whole now put better than 50% odds on an eight rate increase by the Fed's June 2022 meeting, based on CME Group tool that tracks market pricing. Raising rates poses a risky trade-off for Fed policymakers. The risk is not really about the Fed beginning its rate hikes, behind the curve, said Skanda Amarnath, executive, executive director of Employ America, a group focused on encouraging policies that help the workforce. The risk is that the Fed overreacts to this, that markets are penciling in rate increases more quickly, so it could suggest that they are optimistic about the economy's chances, said Neil Duda, head of economics at Renaissance Macro. The Fed has said before lifting rates, it wants to see the economy re return to full employment and inflation that exceeds its 2% target and is on track to average it over time. Europe fears that rising cost of climate action is stirring anger. Surging energy prices have complicated Europe's lofty goals, leaving the government scrambling to offset the impact on households as signs on popular discontent rise. Europe has leaned heavily on natural gas to power homes and businesses while, while it builds out green energy infrastructure. In Spain, the government has attempted to take emergency steps to redirect profits from energy companies to consumers after demonstrators in some towns smashed windows at energy company offices, and thousands of poor families switched off power because they couldn't pay. 
President Emmanuel Macron is subsidizing energy bills in France through the winter and paying 100 euros a month to low earners after a small protest emerged recently in central France, a yellow vest heartland in Greece. The government is trying to soothe ire by redirecting money earned from France's from Greece's carbon emissions trading scheme toward household energy subsidies, while making sure to publicize that the funds come from a tool to combat climate change. A seismic upheaval in the way goods and services are produced will affect millions of jobs in fields as diverse as energy, agriculture, construction, shipping, finance, engineering, retail, and even fashion, altering the social welfare needs of people who will require new skills and training to adapt. Corporate climate pledges often ignore a key component, supply chain. Emissions from supply chains and waste are hugely important, said Tom Cumberledge, an associate director at the Carbon Trust, who works with comparisons companies, governments, and others to create carbon-reducing plans. The climate is being hurt by absolute emissions. Walmart said it's difficult to accurately measure carbon contributions from its many suppliers, and the company does not disclose whether total emissions in its supply chain have been increasing or declining each year. The company said about 95% of the carbon emissions related to its business come from its supply chain. The number of companies voluntarily submitting their emissions reports and reduction goals to the Scientific-Based Targets Initiative, a nonprofit that assesses and improves company targets, doubled this year to more than 2,000, said Alberto Carrillo Pineda, the co-founder of the initiative. Last week, the organization released the criteria companies, well, the criteria companies will have to meet to reach net zero goals later and they include steep reduction in emissions from supply chains. Mr. Carrillo Pineda noted that the companies provide the data voluntarily, so there's no full guarantee that companies always including every emission. Eventually, companies may be forced to do so. I'm tired. Democrats push for agreement on tax dedu deduction that benefits the risk. That benefits what? tax deduction that benefits the rich. Democrats were readying an agreement on Tuesday that would repeal a cap on the amount state and local taxes that homeowners can deduct as part of a broader $1.85 trillion spending bill, a move that could amount to a significant tax cut for wealthy Americans in liberal states. Liberal Democrats have scoffed at the push to include the costly proposal in the domestic policy package, particularly as party leaders have curtailed or eliminated other spending priorities as they pared down a $3.5 trillion blueprint to, appe to appease moderate and conservative-leaning Democrats. What exists is unacceptable, and one way or another it will be dealt with. It remains unclear whether the agreement would appeal broadly or if Democrats plan to impose an income gap to prevent the wealthiest Americans from receiving what amounts to a tax cut. To get around that, the five-year suspension assumed that the cap is reinstated in 2026 for another five years, allowing Democrats to use a budget sleight of hand to show its removal as revenue, revenue, neutral, revenue neutral in the traditional 10-year window that lawmakers look to when considering a bill's impact on the federal deficit. Some Democrats appear confident that lawmakers would act again in five years to prevent the cap from going back into effect. Democrats accused Republicans of using the cap to pay for other tax cuts for the rich and to penalize liberal states. BP's profit, rise, BP, BP's profit rises as oil and gas producers soar. BP said on Tuesday that higher oil and natural gas prices had led to sharp, sharply higher earnings in the third quarter. Prices for oil have steadily risen over the last year as economies have expanded since pandemic lockdowns, and BP joined other oil companies in reporting a big jump in quarterly earnings. BP, which is based in London, said that it received about $66.39 on average for a barrel of oil in the quarter, compared to $37.77 in the earlier period, acknowledging the role that the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies have played in lifting prices in recent months. BP said that the producer's decision-making on production levels continues to be a key factor in oil prices. OPEC and its allies, including Russia, are expected to meet on Thursday to discuss production levels. On a call with analysts, Mr. Looney shrugged off what may be growing pressures to break up big oil companies. 
Recently, Third Point, a New York-based fund management firm, suggested that Royal Dutch Shell, BP's rival, could be substantially more valuable if it broke up an oil business and a lower and if it broke up into an oil business and a lower carbon energy business. Now I do remember what I did last time. The one that we lost is after I read this article, I looked at BP. That's probably why I looked up Lagos because now I'm starting to look up. I'm getting a sense for like how I want to do this. BP Iraq operations. We go to news. We won't have the New York Times in here, but we have Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, The Motley Fool, uh, Reuters. Uh, I mean, we got one New York Times article a couple days ago. What does it say? In the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America, government-owned energy companies are increasing oil and natural gas productions of Euro U.S. and European com companies pair supply because of climate concerns. But the point is, and what I went on to rant the last video, is that BP has been operating in Iraq ever since we invaded. And also there's Chinese national firms in there. So you think that, oh, it's Russia against China. It's uh, uh, United States, I mean, Russia against the United States. It's uh, United States against China. Those are the puppets on the hands, right? Because they asked me to go to Iraq. They have my friends. I dodged that, right? Literally dodged bullets. But my friends, my family went there. My friends, my family, they're injured. The people are sick. People are dead. People are, you know, they're no longer as they were when they left. They are different after having served. Why did they serve? So BP could operate in Iraq, only to say now it just wants to get out, made enough money. There's enough money you've, you've earned over there because of the blood of people that now you're, you're done with it, you're ready to turn it back over to the government. It's not just that I, I heard that Visa is operating in Iraq. You know, we already know of Blackwater. We know of all the military war profiters, the obvious ones who make money off of death directly, off of bombs directly. But what about all these other guys? The KFC is over there, the whatever, whatever. I'm sure, just look around the world. These com com companies didn't just enter that country. It's usually on the tip of a gun. That's how history works. Empire is stupid. And being a soldier asked to die for an em empire and BP to make a couple more bucks on the bottom. It's an idiotic way to live. We are going to stop that. And then I also I brought up um, a um, the biggest crime that we're talking about, which is the crime against... Um, Soldiers, you're breaking the trust between those who defend and the government. And then I went into, like, my grandpa served. There's, some, there's something, like, genetically, when, when you're in, you meet people who, like, they just want the money or they want the stability. But you also meet families. So it's like, no, my dad was in, my uncle was in. There's a lot of military families that are just generations of people who serve, you know. And, like, my, my grandpa, I think I mentioned uh, my grandpa threw a mugger off the bus. Um, my dad chased down a... A girl, she got purse snatched in L.A., chased down the mugger. He got shot for that. He survived. That was before I was born. But, yeah, there's there's good people out there. When uh, when I was in Occupy Wall Street, not to toot my own horn, but, like, I offered to do the the um, conflict resolution. You walk around the park. You make sure you break up fights. People, you know, no, um, there's people out there who just are interested in keeping the peace. We like to keep a chill vibe. And usually we're a part of chilled vibes. And so that's what we're trying to do here. But on the other side, you have these people who like to create these wars and send us off for wars of profit. That's not really cool. We have to end that. How do we end that? We have to hold accountability. And there's a lot of soldiers out there who are mad at Biden running because he voted for the war. We don't want another warmonger. We're going to keep the peace now. We're going to turn the energy, which we were born with, towards the proper targets. That's what this is about, grounding that energy into objective reality. Objective reality is that there are warriors out there, there's soldiers out there, there's police officers out there, they're my family, and they like peace and they like justice. So let us seek some peace and justice. But the real peace and justice, it's not over there in Iraq, is it? It's here. We need peace and justice here in America. How can you go and criticize a neighbor, right? It's in every religion to cast out hypocrisy and cynicism. So let's do that. That is what we are doing. And then I shared a story about I expanded on the idea about service and how I was in basic training, and I said a story about basic training, but it's going to take too long, so we will say that story some other time because I need some coffee. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get some coffee, and I have two more days to do it today. So I have like three more hours of speaking. Meta makes changes to marketing strategy amid scandal. The so-called media review, the first for Meta, the new parent company named for Facebook and its sister apps, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger, concluded on Tuesday 
when it chose the Spark Foundry Agency as its new global planning and buying partner. Winning the Meta account offers agency access to the social media behemoth's deep pockets and sizable influence. Advertisers Week, a recent industry conference featuring featured panels presented by Meta, which has also sponsored events for the Association of National Advertisers and the American Association of Advertising Agencies. Meta, like many other companies, works with both creative agencies, which help design and produce marketing campaigns, and with media agencies, which help determine where the ads go, during a large-scale boycott of social network last year by advertisers. Upset with the platform's policy around hate speech, Colleen DeCourcy, Wyden Kennedy's chief, exe- chief creative officer, said the situation created a lot of hard conversations inside the agency. Asked in Time Magazine whether she expected Facebook to be a client in 2021, she said, if I was a betting person, I wouldn't put too much of my dollars on that space. A Whiting Kennedy spokeswoman said the agency was no longer working with Meta and that they parted ways in the first half of the year. As Meta's troubles mounted, employees at some of the agencies, prote- at some of the agencies protested the idea of having the company as a client. Ad agencies pushing back on Facebook culture. Opioid maker wins major victory in California trial. Four manufacturers of prescription opioids won the pharmaceutical industry's first major legal victory in the opioid crisis, turning aside claims by local California governments that they contributed substantially to the epidemic. The manufacturers include Johnson & Johnson, which has a nationwide opioid settlement offer pending. Tiva, a maker of generic opioids based in Israel. Allergen, a subsidiary of AbbVie and Endo Pharmaceuticals. Even if the judge could infer that the rise in opioid prescriptions must have logically included the medically inappropriate ones, he wrote, the plaintiffs did not offer evidence to show that without rank speculation, the volume of those prescriptions helped create the public nuisance, and if so, to what extent. The rule underscored what legal experts have asserted from the outset, that about opioid litigation, that apportioning responsibility will be very difficult because opioids pass through so many entities, including manufacturers, medical supply distributors, doctors, and pharmacies, including big box retailers, before reaching a patient. Endo did not make false claims or misleading statements, and Endo's law, lawful conduct, did not cause the widespread public nuisance at issue in plaintiff's complaint, Teva said. In a statement, Teva said in a statement that a clear win for many patients in the U.S. who suffer suffer from opioid addiction and will only come. Mm. Teva said in a statement that a clear win for many patients in the U.S. who suffer from opioid addiction will only come when comprehensive settlements are finalized and resources are made available to all who need them. Teva and Allergen are currently on trial in New York, the first jury trial in an opioid case. Both Endro and Johnson & Johnson have already settled in that case. Johnson & Johnson, referring to its pharmaceutical division, Janssen, which makes its opioids, said the well-reasoned tentative decision reflects the facts of the case. Janssen's actions relating to the market and promotion of its important prescription pain medications were appropriate and responsible and did not cause any public nuisance. More same-sex couples may be eligible for Social Security survivor benefits. Surviving members of same-sex couples who were unable to marry because it wasn't yet legal may now be eligible for survivor benefits from Social Security. Even after winning the right to marry across the United States more than six years ago, some same-sex couples have faced challenges obtaining certain benefits. To qualify for survivor benefits, for example, couples need to have been married at least nine months. Recent developments ensure that both groups of survivors, those who are able to marry and those who are not, will have access to benefits. On Monday, the Justice Department and the Social Security Administration dropped Trump-era appeals of two class action suits in the Ninth Circuit. Survivor benefits are now equally available to everyone, including potentially thousands of same-sex partners who could not marry their loved ones and may have thought it was futile to apply. The group filed the two suits in 2018. Survivors can collect on their partner's earnings record if it is higher than their own retirement or disability benefit, or they can collect the benefits as a way to delay their own benefits, which they can collect later when they are worth more. Another Apple worker says a company retaliated against her 
Janek Parrish, a former Apple Maps program manager, accused Apple and Tim Cook, Apple's chief executive, of violating federal labor law by firing her in retaliation for forming the employee group known as Hashtag Apple Two. Deirdre O'Brien, Apple's human resource chief, told employees at a September meeting viewed by the New York Times that the company tracks pay and closes wage disparities whenever they are found. Barbara Don Underwood, an Apple retail store employee in Georgia, sued Apple for $1.7 million, accusing the company of failing to stop a co-worker from sexually harassing and assaulting her, and then retaliating by firing her while she was trying to return to work after taking leave. Miss Parrish, before she was fired in October, collected more than 500 stories from people who said they were current or former Apple employees, describing verbal abuse, sexual harassment, retaliation, and discrimination at work. Miss Parrish said Apple told her she had been fired for deleting files from her company computer and phone before handing them over to be examined while, company investigate, while the company investigated whether she had leaked the recording of an Apple meeting to media outlets. People don't want to be targeted for, by executives for, retaliate, for retaliatory investigations when they've done nothing wrong. For some Apple workers, Ms. Jovic, an outspoken former employee, has been a rallying point. As demand for green energy grows, solar farms face local resistance. Until recently, most farms were built in the West, where abundant sunshine powered industrial scale solar arrays and installations were <sighs> further away from, I see I'm falling asleep, from sight lines. In the first half of this year alone, developers installed 5.7 gigawatts of solar capacity for a total of 108.7 gigawatts of capacity. Pum, pum. Sufficient, to reach eight, eight, uh, sufficient to reach 18.9 million U.S. homes, according to Solar Energy Industries Association. Typically, five to seven acres are needed to create one megawatt power, said Matt Birchby, co-founder and president of Swiss, Swift Current Energy, a solar developer that is working on a proposal for Clark County, Kentucky. Improvements in the capabilities of the panel, including the development of so-called bifacial panels that capture the sun on both sides of the panel, allow for a greater electricity generation and fewer panels, meaning a smaller footprint. Some residents created a group called Friends of Columbia Solar to promote their view that more solar power is necessary to combat climate change. Another solution for developers is agrovoltaics, a technology that allows land to be used for both farming and solar power. And we've had to been trying to tell local officials that their support for solar is, is, is not a simple story. Say Juan Pablo Vela is a co-founder of Friends of Columbia Solar. We give you the solar you need. CDC recommends COVID vaccine for young children. Every million dose give Every million doses given to children age 5 to 11 would prevent about 58,000 cases and 226 hospitalizations in that group. According to the CDC, immunizing these children is expected to prevent about 600,000 new cases from November 21st to March 20, for November 2021st to March 2022nd. Vaccination of children ages 5 to 11 years old will not only help prevent COVID-19 infections and serious consequences of infection in this age group, but will also help children emotionally and socially, said Dr. Pamela Rockwell, who represents the American Academy of Family Physicians on the CDC panel. Children ages 5 to 11 will receive one-third of the dose authorized for those 12 and older, and the vaccine will be delivered with smaller needles and packaged in smaller vials to avoid mix-up with adult doses. Schools in all 50 states already require certain vaccines, but those have full approvals from the FDA. COVID vaccines for children have only been given emergency authorizations thus far. The risk appears to decline in children 12 to 15 and is expected to be even lower in younger children, experts said in the meeting. Last week, Moderna said its vaccine produced a potential immune response in children ages 6 through 11 who received half the adult dose. Military grants few vaccine exemptions as the deadline looms. Two months after the Pentagon began requiring all troops to get the coronavirus vaccine or face dismissal, the vast majority now have shots, in part because no one received because none received religious exemption, military officials said. 
While vaccine exemptions are often broadly worded, requests based on religious beliefs are coming under close scrutiny in the military and the Department of Veteran Affairs, the first federal agency to impose a mandate. Across the country, there are at least 40 legal challenges to vaccine and testing mandates issued by cities, hospitals, universities, and other employers that have yet to move forward, while others have been knocked back. Anyone seeking one of Anyone seeking one from the Pentagon or Department of Veteran Affairs would be required to have an established history of adherence to a religion that prohibits vaccines, among other things. The U.S. Department, the U.S. Air Force hits its vaccine deadline with nearly all of its troops vaccinated. Some people have embraced vaccine conspiracy theories or have been fearful of possible side effects or do not see themselves at risk for the virus. It's a lawful order, Mr. Kirby said that of the vaccine mandate, and the commanders have the right to ultimately do what they need to do for the readiness of their unit. And if that comes to doing something of a punitive nature, they certainly have the right and the authority. On a military subgroup on the social news and message board site Reddit, people swapped advice on how to talk to those who are resisting a vaccine from offering scientific evidence to refuting claims that vaccines stem from aborted fetal cells to noting that troops take far more dangerous risks in combat Not everyone in New York wants, wanted the cor coronavirus to lose. For nearly a year now, a small team of officials from City Hall and the Public Health Department have poured over detailed reports about how vaccine misinformation has spread through New York City. In March, the city's Polish community was treated to false claims that the mRNA vaccine were designed to annihilate Christianity in the Polish nation. A city report in March described a rumor prevalent in New York's Haitian neighborhoods that the vaccines were created to reduce the black population. Each of these bits of misinformation was reported to the city's vaccine command center, a high-level group at City Hall, created to help oversee New York's vaccine vaccination drive. The intelligence in that report is compiled by a team of about 15 people inside the city's health department, a handful of other city officials, and, research, and a research firm, GroupSense. City officials' monitoring of citizens engaged in legally protected gatherings is a tricky matter, particularly in a city that for years allowed its police department to spy on Muslim communities and keep a rolling database of almost entirely innocent citizens, led thousands of New Yorkers to believe that the Brooklyn Army Terminal vaccination, oh yeah, overwhelmingly black men. In January, the analysts of the Vaccine Command Center alerted city officials when a widely circulated WhatsApp message wrongly led thousands of New Yorkers to believe that the Brooklyn Army Terminal vaccination site had a large number of extra doses, sparking a rush on the facility. How Blue and Red States Deal with COVID Deep blue states will need to put their egos and blinders aside and adapt to the endemic COVID world, lest they become as diluted as the deep red states. Do the deep blue states really want to live in a state of emergency for years to come um, to maintain a perceived moral and intellectual high ground? Comparing different areas of the U.S. suggests there has been many preventable deaths. I live in a red state in a county with slightly over half the people vaccinated. Rather than berating the caution of the deep blue states, perhaps an article for deep red states Encouraging more precaution could actually serve to help us get to the post-COVID normalcy we all crave. As prison populations have slowly declined, older, older people serving longer sentences have largely been left behind. So there is a worsening crisis of aging, sickness, and, and lonely deaths in New York, as in other states. To protect our elders from the horrors of growing old behind bars, policymakers must act to provide meaningful release opportunities, including by passing the Elder Parole Bill here in New York State. Yeah, that last one I think I mentioned when I first recorded this, that you have all these sentences that jumble together sometimes. That will, and that's why um, you have the link below, which has a link to the Google Doc with these articles. So if you ever want to read more about this, or you're like, oh, that was interesting, or I remember about 20 minutes in, Shaz like, said something interesting. Just go find the article. You go to the link, how blue, and then this is the opinion, the letters. So you have a pub. Uh, that was a couple sentences from a couple letters to the editor. They all kind of jumbled together. But we did good. How old, How long is this? An hour and a half? That's not that bad. I had a couple good rants, a couple good emotions out, some of that, some of that subconscious thinking. Uh, I might get a pizza or something, and then, or a coffee. I need coffee, not food, right? And then we got two more of these babies. Good to go. Shaz Barbaric, yours for the revolution, signing out.